I first came to Cambodia in uh, 2007, and uh, Pastor Jesse invited me to come uh, when, in 2007, and uh, he gave me a bunch of uh, business people, and uh, about 15, 16 of them, and they say, ah, here, here are the business people, disciple them. And I just, you know, I didn't know what I was supposed to do, just kept praying and asked God to give me wisdom, and that's uh, the beginning of my uh, ministry here in Cambodia. Uh, one of those guys that you know well is our Brother Sophie, and now uh, we have spent more than 10 years together discipling, you know, ministering, and today God has used him tremendously uh, to bless this church, right? And, uh, you know, his company gave a piece of land to this church here, all right? Yeah. That's a guy. Yeah. I'm so glad to be associated with him. At least I feel a little bit important now. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Here's my testimony. In the book of Psalms 139, you know, the Bible says that God created me beautiful. God created me perfect. But the guy that made it imperfect was me. I, I ravaged the body. I spoiled the perfect body. You know, and if you, if you know, every night I, when, I, when I go home, I'll walk right to the, uh, to the bathroom and there's my bathroom scale, the, the weighing machine. And you know, weighing machines are never my friend. <laughs> Whenever I stand on a weighing machine, I get awfully shocked. It gets, it gets more and more. I always tell people I do not put on a lot of weight. I just put on one kg a year for every year of my marriage. I've been married for 37 years now. That's my wife. She looks like uh, my little sister. Huh? <laughs> and you know, if, you, uh, if the weighing machine is, to, is able to announce the weight, the weighing machine might just say this, one at a time, please. You know, in September last year, I, I, I had food poisoning after eating oysters. I never want to touch oysters ever again. After eating oysters, I, was, I had food poisoning. I was sent to the hospital. And I could not, I could not eat anything. I could not drink anything. And after the, the doctors tested me, they realized that my kidney had shriveled, dried up. And they managed to revive the kidney after two days of drips. But uh, in the battery of tests that they did, they found a lesion on my liver, about 10 cm high, uh, 10 cm, and I I was told that uh, quickly go for a CT scan, and when the scan came back, thank God it wasn't cancer, it was non-malignant. But you know the accuracy is only about 70 percent, and the doctor say I want you to do an MRI test, that will give you about 90 percent accuracy. So back came the MRI results, 99% non-malignant, 1% malignant. He says, I'm not very happy with the 1%. I don't want you to carry the cancer with you, and if it ever is cancer, you're going to be in trouble. I said, okay. So he did a biopsy, and that's really accurate. Puts something into the liver, clip, 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 and out comes a little meat, and they do the test. Back came the result, yes, it's cancer. November 20th, when I got the results right in front of the doctor's office, my entire world collapsed on me. I said, God, I am finished. I am going to die. Cancer, it's a sentence on me. Why must it be me? You know, those kind of thoughts of being processed. And then I had to hear so many voices coming to me. Uh, uh, Pastor Ronald, you do this. Pastor Ronald, you take this. Pastor Ronald, you know, you should not do this. You should not do this. You've got to go to the hospital. You cut. Some says don't cut. Some says go to Germany. Some says go to Italy. I was drawn into different directions. Not good. It was stage 3 cancer. That's the bad news. But the good news is that the cancer was encased in a membrane and it was contained. It was not spread. And the doctor told me this kind of cancer is actually very slow growth. It will not spread. 
there's no pain, there's no, no sign, no symptoms. You can live for the next two years and suddenly it breaks and that's it. That's the end of you. Stage three to four and then within a month you're gone. It says you have to cut it away. So 70% of my liver was cut off in January uh, together with the gallbladder. The only, the, only, the only organ in the body that could grow back is the liver. You know, you know that, right? That's the only organ that can grow back. And thank God that it has grown back. But it's grown a little bit out of shape. I don't know. It's very strange looking here, right? Uh, that's because... No, not, 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 not that I'm fat. No, I lost 20 kg. Can you imagine? It, the last time I was here, if you look at me, I look like this. <laughs> that was how I looked. Then, you know... 10 days in the hospital and I, I was out. I came out of the hospital. I was well. I went home. But 10 days later, 10 days later, just 10 days later, I collapsed in the toilet uh, because there wasn't enough blood. And they, they, I was vomiting blood. The HB count came from 13.5 down to 7. Normal ladies, normal count for ladies is about 10. But mine was 7. You know, not enough blood at all. They discovered that my, my stomach was squirting blood and uh, they, they had to transfuse four packs of blood into my bloodstream to keep me alive. Otherwise, I would be dead. I was shocked. How could this ever happen to me? And because my kidney was, uh, uh, my, my liver was cut away, there was not enough protein. And because there was not enough protein, uh, the gout flared up. And I had my hands, my feet like this, you know, cannot move. And because my kidneys was not functioning well, the creatinine was high, they could not, they could not give me medicine. So for 20, 30 days, my hands and feet was like that. I couldn't move. I couldn't do anything, you know. And I was crying out to God. I said, God, let me die. Have you ever said that before? Let me die. If you cannot heal me, let me die. I'm, thank, I'm very thankful that God didn't listen to me. <laughs> you know, I, I struggled a lot during those few weeks. You know, because of my uh, allergy to uh, all kinds of antibiotics, there was no antibiotics that could treat my, by my germs and viruses in the kidney, uh, in the liver, after the operation. So it took a long time to heal. And they have to put a special tube from here. Uh, they call it the PICC line that goes straight from the hand uh, in right into the heart. And for 24 hours, 28 days, they were pumping antibiotics into my, my, my heart just to keep me alive. If you think of anything bad, it was during those uh, 28, 30 days. Two months in all, 35 days hospitalization. I was there, I was crying out to God. I said, God, I don't want to live. But I want to declare to you today that I'm 100% well now. Yeah. The doctor said, you are cancer-free. After the operation, he said, you are cancer-free forever. I dare declare to you that you have no more cancer. So I said, praise the Lord. But you know, with all those complications, I doubted it. I even doubted that I will live. Thank God today, externally, I'm 100% well. But, you know, it takes a little bit of time internally. The wounds, you know, they have to sew the muscles to the fat, to the layers, and then to the tissues and so on. So there are multiple layers of uh, uh, sewing inside. It takes time to heal. So please pray for me that God will completely heal me so that I can go to India, I can go to Nepal, I can go to different parts of Cambodia, different parts of uh, uh, India and uh, Kazakhstan to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, to teach pastors and leaders. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know, in the Bible, in the Bible, Elijah was brought to the desert because Ahab and Jezebel wanted to kill him. You think... You think for a while that I, uh, Elijah wanted to go to the desert? I doubted he wanted to go. But he, was, he had no choice. He was brought to that place. 
And the Bible says that he was brought there to this place called Brook Cherith, right? Cherith Ravine. That's a place, a place of hiding, a place where, uh, uh, a place of hiding and a place of repair. Now, God repaired my physical body just like Elijah. God had to do some repairing and God was preparing him for a ministry that he was going to take place, uh, that was going to take place after that uh, incident. He had to face uh, the prophets of Baal. He had to face all kinds of situations. And God was preparing him for that challenge. What did I learn? I was so bored to death. Every day when I get up in the morning, I had to, there's no planning. I just get up, sit there, do nothing, stand into blank space, pray to God a few sentences, talk to Him, think for a while, and then off I go sleep again. Sleep and wake up, I grow fat, and I eat again, I sleep again, I sleep again, I wake up again, and 20, 30, 35 days, all like that. It was so monotonous. Can you imagine how Elijah went through? Three and a half years he was in that place. And for three and a half years, every day, the bird called the crow brought food to him, morning, day and night. The same set lunch. Chicken rice in the morning, chicken rice in the afternoon, chicken rice at night, chicken rice in the morning, chicken rice, it's the same. It was so monotonous. I learned that I have nobody to turn to except God. Hallelujah. I learned that I was nobody. I have a measure of success in my business. You know, I drive a nice car. I have a measure of wealth that I could use to, to serve God in the kingdom, right? But when I was in the hospital, I felt so small. I felt so useless. The little nurse, the little nurses that are so small and tiny had to attend to my every need. They have to feed me, they have to bathe me, they have to sponge me, they have to clean me, they have to make sure that they dress my wounds, they comb my hair, they do all kinds of things. I felt so stupid about myself. Obscure. I felt so obscure. You know, in that place that Elijah was in the desert, there was only himself, God and the bird, Right? Is it true? Elijah must have had several degrees, one for healing, one for prophetic ministry, and he probably had a theological sem uh, seminary a degree for theology. But, you know, here he is, he had nobody to brag about, nobody to brag to. He looks at the bird and he says, Hey, bird, I got a degree in theology. I got a master's degree in praying for the sick. And you know what the bird was saying? <laughs> it meant nothing. I felt so obscure. I felt nobody. I felt like nobody. And you know, you can be the CEO, you can be the senior pastor, you can be the, the best uh, financial planner, the financial man, you can be the, the, the personal assistant to the big boss, and so on. But it doesn't matter. When you are in that place of repair, you are nothing. And mind you, those are instances that you never want to go. And God will kick you there. Uncertainty was the next thing that I had to deal with. Elijah had to deal with his uncertainty because he, he expected the crow, the, the, the raven, to bring the food, right? What if the raven turns around and says, today I decide I want to eat the sad lunch? He was so uncertain. He never knew when his food was going to finish. He never knew when the water was going to finish. I never knew exactly when God was going to heal me, whether he was going to heal me, whether I was going to die. Uncertain. I was so uncertain about myself. But you know, the Bible says, but Elijah stayed there. I said, God, let me die. I don't want to stay here, God. When I looked at my wife, who was my caregiver, 
She's a strong woman. But after three weeks, I saw her crumble. I saw her crying because she could not have enough sleep. And she goes home, she falls flat into the bed and didn't attend to my knee that day. I remember I saw her crying and sleeping. I said, God, why has it got to be me? But I learned that God had to repair me to bring healing to my physical body, to bring healing to my mind, my heart. There are many things that he had to deal with. Now, just like it's cancer, the cancer that has ravaged me, the worst thing that can happen to us is spiritual cancer. Many of us hold spiritual cancer inside our heart for years without even dealing with it. Your sin, the things that box you down, weighs you down, the, the unforgiveness, right? The phonographic uh, uh, addiction that we are in, right? The, 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 the drinking, the smoking, the womanizing things, or, or, or the, 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 some of the ladies will be men. Those are the cancer that plagues us. And God had to deal with me. God had to deal with me, my physical cancer, as much as He's going to deal with your physical uh, a sp a spiritual cancer. God wants to set us free. Today is Easter Sunday. Jesus is alive. He's alive because He wants to heal us. He wants to heal me as much as He healed my physical cancer. He's going to heal the spiritual cancer. And you know, when we are healed of our spiritual cancer, this church will be a powerful church. Because they that, you know, uh, the, 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 he that is bold, the, he, he that is righteous, the Bible say, is bold like a lion. Boldness comes because we, we live a righteous life. Today, I want to impart this to you. I want to declare to you that God can set you free if you are willing to allow Him to bring you to the place of repair. May God bless you. May God minister to you. May God deeply move you so that you will move in U-turn, in repentance to God the Heavenly Father. What a powerful testimony, amen? Our God heals, amen? Our God heals, our God restores. There's nothing too hard for our God, amen? Because He lives. We can face tomorrow and we can face today, amen? With a little bit of time that we got left, uh, I just want to share a little bit more about the Easter story. Uh, stick to Easter tradition <laughs> and remind us all uh, about what Jesus did for us. You know, Easter says that you can put hope in the tomb, but it won't stay there. Amen? Amen. We have a hope in Jesus, and we learn from the scriptures in Romans 15:4, it says, Everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. Amen? And so we study the word. We, we listen to it. We allow it to wash over our minds and wash over our hearts so that we may have hope for the future. Because there's many that have gone before us we have a, a very big spiritual family. Many generations have gone before us in the faith to show us to persevere, that we always have hope. Amen? During the time of Christ, God's people were in trouble. And there was examples I was going to share with you about the, from the Old Testament, but we'll just keep it short. <laughs> uh, the chosen people who were supposed to be a light to the Gentiles were themselves in darkness. They were disillusioned. They were hurt. They were discouraged. And you know, in the Old Testament, there's a few different words for sin, but what I found was with each one of them, they also meant the sacrifice for sin. They mean sin like offense, sin that means missing the mark, sin that means um, wavering between two opinions, being divided in your mind and in your heart, 
But in each one of those words for sin, there's also a part in the original Hebrew that means the atonement for sin, the opportunity to make it right. In each of those cases, even to Cain, where God said sin is lying at the door, there, the word for sin was sin, yes, it's waiting. This habit of darkness is waiting for you, but there's also a sacrifice of, for sin waiting for you. You have the chance to make it right. In each one of those cases, God was always, always offering restoration. Always saying, hey, Israel, you missed the mark this time, but there's an opportunity for you to make it right. After Elijah was at, fed by the ravens, he went and confronted the prophets of Baal. And he said to Israel, he said, how long are you going to waver between two opinions? And they didn't answer he said, if you believe in God, then choose God. If you believe in Baal, then choose Baal. And they couldn't answer. They were completely divided in their mind and heart. And so Elijah's response was build an altar and get two bulls. Now, every Israelite knew that meant a sin offering. Putting bulls on the altar, offering bulls was a sin offering. They knew that their divided mind, their divided heart was sin. It was wrong. But still, God was giving them a chance to make it right and to choose right. Fast forward to the time of Christ. People were missing the mark. People were breaking God's laws. They were falling into legalism. People were divided in their minds. Is the Messiah ever going to come? Do we really have a hope in God? They traded true heartfelt devotion for rituals and traditions. At one end of the spectrum, they were in total disillusionment. And at the other end of the spectrum, they were in total hypocrisy. They were in bondage to sin, oppressed by demons, plagued by sickness. But then Jesus came. But then hope showed up in bodily form. And he didn't just come for Israel. He came for all mankind. After demonstrating for three years what the kingdom of God truly looked like, Jesus offered his life as the final sacrifice for sin, the final atonement, the final act, so there would never have to be a blood sacrifice again. And we're gonna, I'm going to show you a video in just a minute. This video is an illustration not of what was happening physically to Jesus, but of what was happening spiritually as he hung on that cross. Do you ever wonder what it was like for him spiritually to take the weight of all of our sin, to take the weight of all of our sickness, our hopelessness, our discouragement, our bondage, to take all of that on himself? The Gospels tell us that darkness covered the land for about three hours. And as all the sins of the world came on him, he experienced, the separ he experienced separation from God. And that's when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And after taking it all upon himself, he said, it is finished. That meant the price has been paid. Amen? Finished. Finished. No more sacrifices. The final sacrifice for everything past and everything future. The final sacrifice was finished. And at that moment, the Bible says the veil in the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. Releasing to us the presence of God. It was Father God saying, it's finished. The price has been paid once and for all. Come, come into my presence. The veil was torn, the earth quaked, the rocks were split. Because he was without sin, he was able to pay the complete price for sin. But unlike all the other sin offerings, he remained alive after 
it was finished. Every other sin offering was dead on that altar, and that's when the sin was paid for, but not Jesus. He said, it is finished. The price had been paid. After he said it is finished, he said, Father, now the relationship was restored. He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He breathed his last. Which as we know, the breath, the word for spirit is breath. He breathed, he released his spirit, and then he died. He gave his life. So let's watch this video together so you can enjoy this illustration. commit my spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. When we choose to trust in Jesus as our Savior, we place our hope in the only one who is strong enough to save us. When you see what Jesus endured for you, for all of mankind, do you have any doubt left that he's strong enough to help you in your current situation. He is able, he is strong enough. And what we know is that he did not stay dead, <laughs> amen? What we're celebrating today is that he rose from the dead. 
that he did not stay in that tomb. Our hope is alive. Amen? Romans 6, verses 5 to 9 says, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, he was paying for us. That should have been us on that cross. Because we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Amen? Jesus offers us life today. Jesus offers us hope today. He, he could handle it. He handled it. All of your difficulties, all of your problems, he could handle it. He took it all. Romans 5, verses 1 to 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Amen? Amen? Would you stand with me today? I felt strongly as I was preparing for, for today that there's some parts of our lives that maybe are sin. Maybe we've missed the mark. Maybe we've made some mistakes. Those are the definitions of sin. Sin sounds like such a bad, heavy word, but that's not what it means. Sin is just when we make mistakes, we break one of God's laws, Maybe we're divided in our mind, in our heart. Maybe we're doubting. God, what, what do you really have for me? Do you really have good plans for my life? Why, why am I not seeing it yet? God, where are you? Maybe we're feeling a little divided in our mind. And if I could encourage you today with a passage from Ezekiel, all of those things, all those areas in our life where we're struggling those are the areas that are dead. Those are areas that God is ready to breathe on today. God is ready to breathe into your life today. He is ready to breathe that resurrection power into your life and into your situation. Let the dry bones, let the dead things, let the dreams that we've let go of, let the discouragement, the disillusionment, the divided mind, the divided heart, let's let those things go today and let's let God breathe onto us. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me and just listen to this passage of scripture? Then the Lord said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. Let's just begin to receive from the Lord right now. If there's any areas in your life that you feel are dry, that you feel are dead, that you want to speak that resurrection life to right now, look unto Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith. Let your hope arise today. Let your hope arise, for hope will not stay in the tomb. Hope will come out of the tomb. Receive from the Lord right now.
right now. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Lift your voice.